Happy Easter, Bridgepoint. It is good to be together today. My name is Jared. I'm the teaching pastor. We want to welcome those who are with us online and, of course, those who are here in the room as well. What a difference a year makes, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but I am loving Easter this year compared to last year. Um, we, through, through all of this, we've had different highs and lows. And for me, last Easter was probably one of the lowest lows. Like we gathered here with probably fewer than 10 people um, to broadcast a service on Easter morning to, to the church, scattered uh, in every direction. And uh, I preached to a camera and a couple people and walked out of the room deeply saddened because like any big family moment, it's meant to be shared with others, right? And Easter is a big moment for the, the church family. It, it is the biggest deal of the year because we believe that Jesus died, he was really dead, and that he came back to life. And because that is true, that event deserves our full attention. And so it is good to celebrate. We know that we still have many people with us online. And it is awesome to have three services that are filled with people this morning. To see new faces and to see faces for the first time in a long time. Welcome back. It is so good to be together. Um, we, we believe that the resurrection is the centerpiece of our faith for those who believe in Jesus. That there is no event that is more important to us because it just links everything else together. And if you are on this journey where you're trying to make sense of Jesus, you're not exactly sure uh, what to believe of him, or maybe even up to this point you've kind of said it's not, he's not that big of a deal to me, I would challenge you to start with the resurrection. Figure out what you believe about this event. Press into it. Explore it. Examine it. Because I believe that you will find that it is true and that it changes everything. So it's the centerpiece for those who believe, and it's the starting point for those who are still looking. And we are going to look into the resurrection today from a different angle. So uh, God is the author of Scripture, okay? So all of Scripture was inspired by God and written through human authors. And so God is behind it all. He influenced every event that transpired leading up to Jesus. He inspired every word that was written throughout Scripture. And just like with, uh, with a, a painter, only the painter sees how every brushstroke contributes to the larger picture until it is finished, and then people can stand back and behold it. God was painting a picture from the very beginning, and, and while to us it might look as if some of the strokes don't really make any difference, God knew all along that everything that was happening would be leading up to this moment where Jesus would die for sin, be raised from the grave, and be lifted back into heaven. He knew what he was doing. And so now, because we can look at the whole picture, we can begin to appreciate each brush stroke that he used along the way. So that means that when we go back to the Old Testament and look at events that happened long before Jesus, we can start to see that God has been hiding these Easter eggs all along the way. And they're all pointing to Jesus. They're saying, get ready for what I'm about to do. And so for the last several weeks, we have been walking through this series, looking at the very first book of the Bible and seeing how Jesus was there from the very beginning. And there's a story in the book of Genesis that presents an incredible picture of the resurrection of Jesus. It's all about a man named Joseph. And we're going to pick up his story in chapter 41. Chapter 41. So I'd love for you to turn there. Genesis 41. Uh, if you're new, you don't have a Bible, go ahead and grab one from the chairs under you. If you don't have a Bible but would like one, let this be our gift to you. Just walk out of the building with it. We're not going to chase you down. In fact, we'll send you with a blessing. Take it. Read it. Follow along with us every Sunday. All right? And so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 41. Because chapter 41 picks up partway through Joseph's story, I want to catch you up in case you missed it. So Joseph, his father's Jacob, and he has 10 older brothers. And as the 11th brother, Joseph was the favorite. And his brothers knew it. I don't know how favorites worked in your family, but they did not like it. They hated Joseph for it. So much so that one day these 10 brothers conspired against their younger brother. And they plotted first to kill him. And then they decided instead to sell him into slavery. They were out in the fields and some merchants came by and they thought, hey, we can make some cash and get rid of this pest. And so they sold him off into slavery and atrocities unknown. Joseph was carried off into Egypt, suffering unjustly at the hands of his brothers. Once he arrived, he was purchased as property by a man named Potiphar. Uh, God, because God was still with him, raised Joseph up to a position of influence. 
But then things turned for the worse again when Joseph was accused of something he didn't do. And he was blamed for it, condemned for it, and he was sentenced to prison, life in prison. He, he was put into a, a dungeon of a cell placed in the ground. And it seems for a moment like there's this like hopeful uh, end, but then things turn once again and Joseph is left there and forgotten and it seems like all hope is lost. And we said that up to this point, this story really resembles the suffering of Jesus, that Jesus' own people hated him and wanted him gone. So much so that they plotted to kill him. Someone very close to him was the one who betrayed him, sold him off for pieces of silver, turned him over to the authorities. Jesus was arrested even though he was innocent. He was punished for something he did not do. And his punishment was not a prison cell in the ground. His punishment was a tomb in the ground. He suffered, he was beaten, he was murdered, and he was taken down, and he was buried. And those are some of the events that we've been looking at throughout this Holy Week. And we see that, that if the story ended there, if the story ended on what we call Good Friday with Jesus, killed and buried, then all hope would be lost. The dramatic ending to Joseph's story provides us with a series of windows into the life and resurrection of Jesus. And so what we're going to do, we're going to look at it in a, in a rhythm of storytelling and then peering into the resurrection. We're going to look at three parts of Joseph's story, each one providing a unique window into the resurrection of Jesus. But before we get into that, I'd like to just invite you to use a moment of silence to ask God to help you have ears to hear and a heart that will receive. And then I'll pray for us and then we'll jump in. All right, so let's take just a moment to prepare our hearts. Father God, you are here and you are good and you have a plan for this moment in our lives. I pray that nothing would steal that. No work of the enemy, no distractions, no hardness of heart. God, I pray that all who listen would have hearts that are receptive to the word that you want to deliver today. I pray that you fill my words with your power and use them for your purpose. In the name of the risen Jesus, I pray, amen. So, where we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 41, okay, Joseph's in prison, unjustly so, and the most important person in the land is a man uh, called Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, okay? And the king of Egypt has a couple dreams that disturb him, that trouble him, and, and he asks all of the wise counsel around him the meaning of these dreams, and no one can tell him, and as he's disturbed and frustrated, he has a servant, a cupbearer, who had previously spent some time in prison with Joseph. And this cupbearer had had dream, a dream of his own. And Joseph was able to rightly interpret the dream. And exactly what Joseph said would happen, happened. And Joseph had sent him off saying, hey, when you get to the king, remember me. Tell him I'm innocent. But the cupbearer forgot him until this moment. When, when Pharaoh was going, man, I'm having these dreams. I can't understand what they mean. No one can tell me. And the cupbearer comes to Pharaoh and he does the Rhode Island thing. He says, hey, I know a guy. I got a guy. I know who can do that. And so Pharaoh sends for Joseph. Chapter 41, verse 14, it says, So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When Joseph had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now Joseph corrected him a little bit. He said, I can't do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. God's going to give you understanding. And so Pharaoh tells Joseph his two dreams. And Joseph hears them and is able, by the power of God, to explain what God is revealing to Pharaoh. And the outcome of these dreams is that Egypt and all the land around it is going to enjoy seven years of abundant harvest. They're going to have more than enough. But then those seven good years are going to be followed by seven very bad years of terrible famine that will devastate the land. And as Joseph is giving the answer God's providing, he, he ends by saying, hey, Pharaoh, 
most important person in the land, you're going to need to appoint someone to deal with this so that people have food on the other side. And what that person in charge is going to do, uh, they're going to need to create a plan to save food, store it up, and then distribute it at the end. It's as if Joseph is kind of auditioning for the job, right? And he's like nailing the interview before there was an interview. And so Pharaoh hears this and he goes, who better? This is still in chapter 41. Chapter 41, uh, verse 37 The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the spirit of God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. So he's like, you're my guy. Verse 41 continues. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck, had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And the people shouted before Joseph would come. They shouted, make way. Thus he put Joseph in charge of the whole land of Egypt. What happens in this moment? The signet ring. So Pharaoh takes a ring off his finger, places it on Joseph, wraps him in a robe, puts a gold chain on him, puts him in charge and riding in a chariot. And the whole land would just get out of his way and declare that he was coming. The whole point of this description is that Joseph, everywhere he went, carried the authority of Pharaoh. That Joseph had ultimate authority in the land of Egypt. And in a moment, Joseph goes from being placed in the ground to being raised to the right hand of the king, given all authority in the land, to navigate this difficult time, to store up what people would need, and then, when the time came, to have the one thing that the whole world would need. And I believe that in the beginning of this story, we see the first window into the resurrection. Something very similar happened to Jesus. God raised up Jesus to the position of greatest authority. He went from being buried in the ground to being raised up to the place of greatest authority. So we know the story. So the the events leading up, uh, Jesus' life crash landed, right? He was arrested. He was mocked. He was spit upon. He was crowned with thorns. He was beaten to within an inch of his life. He was forced to carry his cross up the hill to Golgotha. He was nailed down and lifted up to bleed out and breathe out, to die on that hill. And he was buried in the tomb, just like all other people have experienced. He was buried. But we know that that's not the end of the story. We are told and we believe that Jesus, who was fully dead, became fully alive. That he was raised up out of the tomb that first Easter morning. His dear friends saw him. He gathered with his disciples. He appeared to crowds of hundreds of people. They touched him. They saw him. They talked with him. They watched him eat. They walked with him. He was really alive. And it changed their lives forever. Recharted the course of human history. And as great as that ascension is, there was more. God raised Jesus up from death to life, and then there was another exaltation that followed. We are told at the end of the Gospels and at the beginning of the book of Acts, which which are the, the biographies of Jesus, and then the story to follow, that at the end of 40 days after Jesus rose from the grave, he gathered his close disciples with him on this hillside outside of Jerusalem, and he charged them with the mission to make disciples. And then there before their very eyes, he was lifted up into heaven, disappeared from right in front of him. This is known as the ascension of Jesus, that he was lifted up from not only death to life, but from earth back into heaven. Mark chapter 16 describes it this way. It says, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, that's the disciples, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Philippians chapter 2 says something similar, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place. He gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see the similarities? Jesus was placed in the ground. 
almost forgotten. Hope was gone. And in a moment, God raised him from that place to the right hand of the king. And he was given authority over everything. There is no authority above Jesus, even to this day. Every breath belongs to him. Every life is under his authority. He reigns and rules over all of his creation. He sustains it by his mighty power. There is nothing that is done that he does not know about. There's no word that is spoken that he does not hear. He governs all things. He is the ultimate authority. And it is before him that one day every person, whether you are ready for it or not, whether you think it's coming or not, every one of us will stand before him and give an account of our lives. Jesus was raised up from death to life and then from earth to heaven, the right hand of God. He was given the place of greatest authority. And in that position, he has the one thing, the only thing that the entire world needs. It's his to distribute however he chooses. And so you see this parallel, and it brings us to this place where we see that both Joseph and Jesus were raised up from a dark past to ultimate authority. It sounds like the making of a supervillain, if you ask me, right? I mean, this is like Batman stuff, right? Dark past, like lots of power. What are they going to do with it? especially if ever they come face to face with the people who put them in that position, right? What would happen if Joseph ever has to face his brothers? What would happen when Jesus, who has ultimate authority, comes face to face with those who put him on the cross? How would he use that authority? Well, this is where the second window of Joseph's story comes in. The story continues, and so uh, Joseph has been raised up, and shortly after uh, Joseph is raised up to this position of authority, the spotlight shines back to Joseph's brothers and his father. And just like in Egypt, the famine is affecting them. They're back in the land of Canaan where they were living. The, The brothers, the father, their extended family, they are all moving towards starvation, devastated by this famine. And there is nowhere to turn but Egypt. Egypt is their only hope. Only place in the world that has food right now. And so the father says to the brothers, I need need you guys to go to Egypt. They They don't have no idea what's happened to Joseph. Last time they saw him, he was being carried away on a cart. They have no idea where he is. He says, I need you to go to Egypt. I need you to ask for food. It's the only way to save our lives. And so these 10 brothers who had betrayed Joseph, sold him off into slavery, begin to journey down toward Egypt with the intention to ask for food. They arrive in Egypt. They say, hey, we're here to appeal to Pharaoh to ask for food. Where do we go? They're sent into Joseph's office, okay? They walk in and they don't recognize him, but he immediately recognizes them, 10 brothers from the land of Canaan. He goes, I know who you are. He doesn't say that to him, but he thinks it. And and so through this strange sequence of events, Joseph gives them food, but at the same time sets them up to be accused of something they didn't do. You got to read the story for yourself, okay? The whole story of Joseph is Genesis 37 through 50. Just read through that. See all the details. But he sets them up to be accused of something they didn't do. So they get their food. They're traveling back to home, and they are, they are chased down by Egyptian authorities. Their bags are open, and it, it's revealed that they are carrying possessions from Egypt that they didn't pay for. So they're accused of stealing. They are dragged back before Joseph, still not knowing who he is, feeling the guilt and the panic and the fear of being brought back before the one in authority that has the one and only thing they need. Are you feeling it? And so when they come back before Joseph, chapter 44, verse 16, this is all they have to say. It says, what can we say to my Lord? Judah replied, that's one of the brothers. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt and we are now my Lord's slaves. So, so when they say this, they're trying to figure out how in the world they got into this situation. Why are things unraveling for them? Why are they being accused of something they didn't do? And it hits them, maybe this is God's justice system. Maybe God is punishing them for their sins many years before when they sold their brother into slavery and they start to feel guilt for the first time in a decade. They start to be aware of their desperate need for mercy. And so they come before Joseph, hoping 
that the one in authority would have mercy on them, hoping that the one with exactly what they need would be gracious to him, to them. They don't know it's their brother. And so the tension continues to build. And in chapter 45, Joseph can keep up the, the facade no more. He breaks down and he sends everyone but his brothers out of the room. And it says that he starts weeping so loud that people in the whole palace could hear it. And what's building here is the tension between getting back at people and giving them forgiveness. If you've ever been in a situation where you've got to grant forgiveness to people who have wounded you, you know that the tension breaks your heart. It feels like it's ripping your soul out, right? And so Joseph is there with the opportunity to condemn and to punish, or to forgive and save. And it just bursts out of him in tears. And then, he says to his brothers, in chapter 45, verse 3, it says, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But because his brothers were not able to answer it, but his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Can you imagine It'd be tough enough to come face to face with him if he wasn't in the position he's in. But now he is the ultimate authority. He has complete jurisdiction over them at this point. He can do whatever he wants to them. He can send them to prison. He can have them executed. He can send them back to their land without any food to suffer and die. Like he can do whatever he wants. And so they are terrified of him. But then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. He goes, don't be so hard. He goes, don't be angry. Don't fight. He goes, God was working for good even when things went wrong. And God has a plan to save And so listen to what Joseph says to his brothers. This is what he chooses to do to the ones who sinned against him. Verse 9 of chapter 45, it says, He said to them, Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You you shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your grandchildren, or your children, your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. He says, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. Do you hear what he said? He said, come close to me. We can be family again. He says, I'll provide for you. You can have everything that belongs to me. I'll give you the best of the land and I'll make sure that you're taken care of even during this terrible famine. And then he says, and I, in doing so, will save you from the destruction that surely would be yours without me. Incredible grace and mercy from the one in authority. And so the second window enables us to look through Joseph's story to see a truth about Jesus Jesus is the one in authority, but this is maybe even more important. Jesus uses his authority to rescue those who sin against him. I need you to hear this. Jesus uses his authority to rescue those who sin against him. And so we must not move too quickly past this because none of us are innocent here. I need you to hear this. Not me, not you, not the person next to you. Like none of us are innocent in this. We have all sinned against Jesus And if sin is what took Jesus to the cross, then that means that anyone who has sinned is personally responsible for what was done to Jesus. This is a difficult truth for us to to own because of the pain and grief and sorrow and regret that it creates in us. But if we have sinned against Jesus, then we are responsible for what is done to him. And we have all sinned. We have all, in different ways, chosen to try life apart from Jesus. Some of you have been following Jesus. You love him, you know him, and yet you still do what you know he doesn't want you to do. We marginalize him. Sometimes we mock him by claiming his name and rejecting him with our lives. Others of you have purposely chosen to order your life without Jesus. Maybe you've even had the grace of a friend or family member that just keeps begging you to give him a chance to come with him. And yet you just keep pushing him away. Not for me, not interested, don't care, don't want to know. 
And so all of us, in one way or another, have pushed Jesus away. We have sinned against him. And by our sin, we put him on the cross. So what that means is that in the story, we are the brothers and sisters that put Jesus in a place of suffering. We are the ones who sinned against him. And he stands in authority over us. And he would have every just right to hold that against us. To condemn us in a moment, to send us away and make us deal with our sin on our own. You messed it up, you deal with it. You deal with the shame, you deal with the grief, you deal with the guilt, you just deal with the consequences. It's your problem, not mine. He could do that. When we stand before him at the end of our days, he could say, only thing you deserve is judgment and condemnation. And he would be right. But that is not who Jesus is. And that's not the picture we see of Jesus in this story. Jesus uses his authority not to pay us back and make us suffer, but rather to provide for us and to save us. He has what we need and he gives it to us freely. He gives us forgiveness. That's why he died. He gives us his spirit who lives within us. He gives us the peace and joy and hope that we are desperate for in this world and can't find apart from him. He gives us help and strength so that we can overcome the temptations that keep dragging us down over and over again. He reminds us of our identity. He provides security. He gives us purpose in life. He has everything we need. And let me be clear that no one else and nothing else can provide that. No king or leader, no government or legislation, no stimulus or job or friend or dream. Nothing can provide for you what Jesus has. He's the authority. And what I need you to hear today is that we put him on the cross and yet he uses his authority to save us in the ultimate act of grace. He says, come and live with me. We can be family again. He says, I will provide for you everything you need. We will live close and I will be with you and I will save you from the thing that would destroy you if you didn't have me. And just like in the story, those who sin against the one in authority are treated like kings and queens. We get what we do not deserve. But that is only experienced by those who choose to come toward Jesus. The brothers, the father, they could have stayed in the other land. Now we'll try it on our own just to take our chances, but they come and it's by coming that they experience and receive the blessing. And the same is true for us with Jesus. You can stay back, you can resist, but there's no blessing in that. It's in the act of coming toward him by saying, I believe in him. I need him in my life. I'm gonna come close to him. I'm gonna pursue him. I'm gonna surrender my life to him in baptism. It's in, in that movement toward Jesus that all that he provides, including salvation from sin, is heaped up onto you in abundance. And some of you, like the brothers, did not expect to come face to face with Jesus today. Maybe you came out of obligation, duty, responsibility. My hope is that in coming face to face with Jesus, you encounter a Jesus that you did not expect. One that is full of kindness and mercy who is for you, not against you, who reigns supreme in ultimate authority, and yet he uses that for your good. And my hope is that when you meet him and his mercy pours over you, you choose to come and share life with him. There's one more layer to this story. So Joseph's family moves to Egypt And as they move to Egypt, they settle. There's this beautiful moment where father and son uh, reconnect. It's sweet. It's meaningful. By moving to Egypt, uh, Joseph's extended family, uh, they get everything that they need. Time passes and Joseph's father, Jacob, dies. Joseph goes to bury Jacob in his homeland and then he returns. And as he returns, the brothers fear that now that the father's out of the picture, Joseph's going to turn on them. Okay, chapter 50, verse 15, it says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So nothing has changed in Joseph's heart, but something has changed in their minds. If you've ever had something happen that caused you to question what used to feel secure, 
We start to ask, does God still love me? Does he still forgive me? Is he going to turn on me now? Is this the line that I crossed that there's no turning back? I need you to hear that if you know the one in authority, you never have to fear that. And so his brothers start to panic. And so they put words in the mouth of their deceased father. And they go to Joseph and say, hey, dad, right before he died, just wanted us to tell you this. Like, just forgive your brothers. They, they didn't really mean it. It's okay. I, I think that's what he said. And Joseph responds like this. Verse 19, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. He goes, you tried to harm me. You were working for evil, but God is so good that he was even able to take your broken plans and bring good out of them. And the good that he's bringing out of them is saving many lives. So through the, the work in Joseph's life, the people in Egypt received the food they needed during a famine and they were saved. The, the people who sinned against Joseph and his extended family received food and they were saved. And we were told elsewhere that people from every nation came to Egypt, came into Joseph's presence, received food from him and went back. So, they were, so people from all over were saved because of what God did through Joseph. There's this rippling impact of the mercy of God. And this was the beginning of God's fulfillment of the promise he gave to Abraham several generations before that when he said that all people on earth will be blessed by a descendant of Abraham. But when God gave that promise, so it's partially fulfilled in Joseph, but when God gave that promise, he was not intending to save people from famine by giving them food. He was intending to save people from sin by giving them forgiveness. And while it's partially fulfilled in Joseph, it's completely fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus comes to give forgiveness and to offer salvation to all people everywhere. And so in this third window, we look toward the resurrection of Jesus and we see that all who come to Jesus will be saved. All. Any nation, any people. So there are no limits to this. You look at the life of Jesus and you see that the people who were marginalized, pushed to the fringe of society, were welcomed by Jesus. Maybe that feels like you today. We see that the people who were labeled, that they were too far gone, too much of a sinner to ever make their way back to God, uh, that Jesus welcomed them and defended them and forgave them. Maybe that's someone you know. The point is that Jesus did not come and die and raise uh, raise to life and be exalted into heaven for one family or one people or one kind of person. It was for all people everywhere, for anyone who would respond. And so maybe you need to hear that for you today. That Jesus came for you. And that salvation, that blessing, that life in him is available to you. Maybe you need to hear that for someone who's around you. This is what God has been working toward since the very beginning. He created us to love him and live in a relationship with him. But sin distanced us from God and destroyed everything that is good. But Jesus then came to reconcile us to God and to restore what is good. He did that through his death that pays for our sin so that when we stand before God at the end of time and have to give an account for all of our sin, Jesus looks at us and he says, he's with me, that's covered. I need that. And you do too. His resurrection proves that Jesus is God and he has authority. And then his ascension places him in the position of highest authority, which he uses not to punish and condemn, but to forgive and save. This is the good news of Easter. We have a risen Lord, full of power, ultimate authority, who loves you and is for you. And my hope is that wherever you are coming from, you would come face to face with Jesus, that you would choose life with him, And so I want to leave you with two questions. My hope is that you'll reflect on these in the days to come, and these might draw you closer and closer to Jesus. The first question is this. What makes you aware of your dependence on Jesus? What makes you aware day to day of your need for Jesus and what only he offers? Is it a a battle with depression, anxiety, and stress, and you just know you can't overcome it on your own? Maybe it's a cycle of sin that you can't get out of. Maybe for you, is this awareness that you can't be who you want to be. 
on your own. Just doesn't matter how hard you try, how hard you work. What makes you aware? Maybe you look around this world and say, how long is it going to be this broken? What makes you aware of your need for Jesus? And secondly, I want to ask you, how will you respond to what Jesus has done for you? How will you respond to what Jesus has done for you? So we talked about it, saved you, advocated for you, provided for you. How will you respond to that? For some of you who are still questioning who Jesus is and still struggling to know what place he should have in your life, I want to offer you two things. We have a, a short book, a resource, back at Next Steps. It's called uh, The Case for Easter. It just answers some of the biggest questions about the resurrection. And so if you want to explore more, just stop by there and pick up a copy, our gift to you. We have a class coming up called Alpha that is all about investigating Jesus, coming to know who he really is. So if you are really curious, invite someone to go along with you, take that class and find out for yourself. If you are ready to make the decision to come to Jesus, then be baptized. That's this expression of our commitment to him, our desire to share life with him. And so you can text the number on the screen if you're with us online. Uh, If you're here in the room, then I encourage you to stop by Next Steps and let us have that conversation with you. And for everyone, the hope is that we might respond with a life of gratitude to the one who used his authority not to condemn, but to save even those who sinned against him. Let's pray. Father God, I love you so much. And I'm so thankful that you have chosen not to hold my sin against me. It makes my knees tremble to think about trying to stand before you and defend myself. there would be no punishment that you could give that I would not deserve for the many times that I've turned from you, chosen life apart from you. And yet over and over again, God, you give us more grace and we worship you. I pray that if there are any people here today that need to turn to Jesus and come close to him, that they would choose that, that nothing would hold them back. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna move into a time of communion. So I invite you at home to pull out your elements, start to distribute those. If you're here in the room, hopefully you pick those up on the way in. You can go ahead and start to open those. We do this every week. These elements, which were instituted by Jesus, represent his body broken for us and his blood that was shed for us. It takes us back to the cross to remind us of the high cost of the forgiveness we've been granted. As we said with Good Friday, forgiveness always comes at a cost to the one who gives it. And our forgiveness was costly to Jesus. But he bore it joyfully out of love for you. And so as you have a moment to take these elements, I want you to use it to say thank you to Jesus and then to remember that the grave could not hold him. So even though he paid for our sin, he won that battle in the end. And so let's use this time to be thankful for Jesus who is crucified and to be worshipful of Jesus who is risen. Go ahead and take a few moments right where you're at.